Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video 35. This is on mechanisms that increase genetic uh, variation. Uh, genetic variation is the spice of life. It's played against the environment and causes natural selection or adaptation to local environment. Now sometimes, however, in nature we see the opposite of variation. Uh, example would be this fellow right here. This is uh, Charles II of Spain. Um, he was of the Habsburg uh, family in the end of the Habsburg dynasty, um, which was important all across Europe, um, and ended uh, kind of the age of expansion and this wonderful time in, in Spain's history. Um, he even had what's called the Habsburg chin, or this prominent um, chin. Um, but if you look at his pedigree, it looks a little different than a normal pedigree. A normal pedigree is going to expand outward as you bring in new blood uh, and get wider and wider and wider as you go towards the bottom. And this one actually gets narrower. It tends to kind of focus down here just on Charles II. And the reason why is, is due to inbreeding. Right here we've got uh, like an uncle and a niece. Right here we've got like direct siblings. And so we have all of this inbreeding. And what that does is it aggregates all those traits together. Um, and so it got to the point where his chin, this is called the Habsburg chin, um, made it impossible for him to chew. Um, and so there were some physical problems. Now, they didn't understand DNA genetics back then. They thought it was sorcery. You actually went through an exorcism to figure that out. But we now know, and nature has known this for a long time, that, that variation is good. And so uh, where does variation come from? Well, like in the last podcast, I talked about how it can arise, um, but how is it maintained is a better way to think about that. I'm not going to talk about viruses. I'll talk about that in the next podcast. But we could break life then into two main types of maintaining genetic variation. In prokaryotes or in bacteria, and we could throw archaea on with this as well, they show what's called horizontal acquisition. So there's no sex. They use binary fission to reproduce. So there has to be some way that they can get variation. A lot of this is just going to be replication mistakes, but they can also share material horizontally. In other words, from species that are around at the same exact time. So three processes I'll talk about are transformation, transduction, and then finally conjugation. Uh, in eukaryotes, uh, they use sex. So sexual reproduction is the way we maintain uh, genetic variation. And Charles of Spain could have done that same thing if his parents would have uh, been marrying outside of the family. Um, and so sexual reproduction does that in three ways. It's what makes you special. First one is, is crossing over during meiosis. Next we've got random assortment or independent assortment. And finally we have random fertilization. And so that's what I want to talk about. These three strategies for maintaining genetic variation in these two different lineages. Variation is the spice of life. In other words, variation is selected against our environment to create uh, all of the different phenotypes that we have today. So these are some bivalves, Donux variabilis, that have all these different um, phenotypes and they're going to live in sand and so depending on what the sand is those could be you know some of the darker ones might not be seen some of the lighter ones might be but also it's important in prokaryotes and so in this culture we've got millions and millions and millions and millions of colonies of bacteria but each of those are going to be different as well and so we don't always see that um, but it's just as important in prokaryotes as it is in us. Now this is actually the tree of life of all life on our planet and if you look at how it really probably uh, flowed it's not as simple as we might think. You have all of these paths going back and forth and back and forth an example that we've talked about this year would be mitochondria. I remember mitochondria were bacteria that eventually have been co-opted for use in eukaryotes. But in bacteria today there's this what we call horizontal transfer. In other words it's transfer of genetic material between organisms that are around in the same evolutionary time period. And so in bacteria there are three ways that they can share genetic material um, between different organisms. And the first one was pointed out by Frederick Griffith in his famous DNA experiment in 1928. Showed us a lot about, you know, there's something that's some magical thing that can be passed from organism to organism. Uh, if you don't remember this, we've got two different types of, of uh, bacteria. We've got the rough that are non-virulent 
uh, and the smooth that are virulent, or in other words, are dangerous. You inject the smooth in, they kill the mouse, the rough don't do anything. He then he killed the smooth, what would be the virulent stri strain, it didn't do anything to the mouse, but this would be that weird discrepant event where when he mixed the heat killed smooth bacteria with the normal rough one, something had been transferred between the bacteria, and so we call that transformation, or there was a transforming factor. Well, how does that work? It's pretty simple. When you have one bacteria bacteria like this and it's got its DNA on the inside, when it dies, so when we rupture that uh, cell wall, the DNA may still be intact. And that can be picked up by another bacteria. And so that other bacteria can actually take in that DNA and make use of it. Now we actually use this. We transform bacteria so we can use that in genetic engineering. For example, to have them make a protein for us. That's how we started making insulin. Um, but it's a strategy that they use uh, to pass those traits from one bacteria to another. Next is the idea of transduction. Transduction requires a phage, and a phage is going to be Here's a picture of the phage right here. It's a virus that infects bacteria, so we call that a bacteriophage. What it does is it injects its DNA in, it then hijacks the cell, so it'll make more copies of the virus, so it's viral replication. But what happens is sometimes when one of these viruses escapes, it'll actually carry some of that bacterial uh, genome with it. It'll then inject that into another bacteria where that bacteria can actually make use of it. And so transduction is another way that we can actually move DNA from one bacteria to another horizontally. And we have to have a vector, and in this case it's a bacteriophage that's doing that. And then the last way that we can actually share genetic material is the closest we have to bacterial quote-unquote sex. Um, and that's usually through the transfer of a plasmid. And so a plasmid, remember, this would be the chromosomal DNA. This would be the, the chromosome of the bacteria. But a plasmid is another little bit of auxiliary um, DNA. In this case, we are talking about the fertility plasmid. I could do this with hand puppets. Essentially, you have two bacteria. This one has the fertility plasmid. It'll connect to that other uh, bacteria and it will share some of its DNA. Um, after it's done that, this one now has a pillus. It has the fertility plasmid and it can pass that on. Now this seems a lot like sex, but again we don't have that meiosis. We're just transferring that um, that DNA, that plasmid, from one to another. Now all of these things are important. In other words, let's say I were to wash my hands every morning with a really intense antibiotic. Well, if I were to do that, I would kill all the bacteria on my hands except those that are um, resistant to that antibiotic. Now those bacteria can get together between my hand washings. They can actually share that genes, the ability to resist antibiotics, and so they get stronger and stronger and stronger over time. And so bacteria aren't as weak as we might think they are, and they also, even though they lack meiosis, they can share genetic material, and also there's going to be mutations going on. Those are prokaryotes. If we talk about eukaryotes, there are really three things that make you special, um, make you the way you are. And the first one would be crossing over. And so during meiosis, during meiosis one, you get a chromosome uh, from your dad. Let's say this is the chromosome you get from your dad, and this is the chromosome that you get from your mom. And each of these chromosomes has a number of genes that are on them go all the way down. This would be uh, after DNA replication, and so this would be the sister chromatid on the other side. It's going to have the exact same genes on this side, so it simply just copied it. But if we didn't have crossing over, all the genes that are found on that one chromosome, which is you know, hundreds of genes would just kind of travel together through time. Except we have crossing over. And crossing over, what happens is the homologous chromosomes, in other words, the chromosome from dad and the chromosome from mom, will actually wrap around each other and they'll share some of that information. And so genes that were on uh, this chromosome from dad um, will be swapped to a chromosome from mom and vice versa. And so that gives us variability. Um, next thing that gives us variability is random assortment, or we sometimes call this independent assortment. And so example, let's say we're talking, a, a real example, let's say we're talking about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a dominant disease, it's a dominant trait. Uh, it affects this portion of your brain, eventually causes death in, in middle age. 
Um, if you get the gene, you're going to get the disease. And so if we look at the genotype of this individual, this is an individual who has Huntington's disease, and then we look through uh, meiosis. So this would be meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Well, let's say that the Huntington gene is found on this chromosome, but the good gene, the non-Huntington's gene, is found on the other one, like that. Well, it's going to duplicate itself, so if it's got a gene on this side, we're going to duplicate it again, and likewise, we're going to have the good gene on this side. But at this point right here, it's going to line up. It's going to line up along the metaphase plate, and eventually that bad Huntington's disease is actually going to go in this direction, and it's going to end up in this sperm, and it's going to end up in that sperm. And so right here, there is a flip of the coin. In other words, if it goes in that direction, you're going to get sperm that have the Huntington's disease in it. And if it goes in that direction, you're going to get sperm that don't. And so that random assortment uh, determines what happens to the offspring that you have. And remember, we have you know, thousands and thousands of genes, and each of those are going to assort independently. And so just with that, imagine flipping thousands and thousands of coins how often are you going to have the same exact coins come up? It's going to be really, really rare. And that's because each of these are going to, are going to assort independently. On top of, and here we also see crossing over occurring right there. And so those two things are, are creating a lot of uh, genetic variability. And then the last one is random fertilization. Um, during the course of your lifetime, males are going to create trillions and trillions of sperm. And females have already created all the eggs that they'll have. But this one egg getting together with this one sperm is really, really rare. And so that also leads to genetic variability. And so what are the odds with a couple where it's not identical twins and they create the same exact child? It's, it's incredibly rare. Um, it's like one in uh, yeah, 8 trillion or something like that, that they would ever be the same because of those three things. And so that's eukaryotic... Uh, um, variation in genetics. The lights just went out, and so uh, this must be the end of the show. So I hope that's helpful.